So this is going to be really hard. So, um, so people have asked me how it was that I came about to write this book. And, you know, there's lots of stories. But the one that, that I like the best goes way back to when I was a teenager. And I was kind of on the cusp of, of uh, deciding what I was going to uh, study whether it was going to be more of North Palm Frit or more of 17th and uh, 16th century English history. Because I had discovered that my family was descended from the ancient and noble family of Clifford in England. So uh, I found that out, and gosh, you know, I wanted to tell people, my family, so I thought my great uncle, and I know many of you know old Pete Clifford, he was an old Yankee, you know, and uh, so I remember he's, he stopped and I said, Pete, I, said, I, I found out our family history that, you know, we're descended from the nobility of England, and he just kind of, <laughs> kind of run out in it. <laughs> So, with that, I decided I'd stay provincial. <laughs> so, well, so, the title is Farms, Flatlanders, and Fords, a story of people and place in rural Vermont. And this book really is about change, and specifically 20th century change in a rural Vermont neighborhood. Now, I, I thought about you know, what, what brings on change? And kind of the things that I focused on uh, include uh, ideas, you know, ideas can bring about change, the movement of people, migrations, and, uh, you know, new technologies and bringing them into everyday life. So uh, the title actually reflects each one of those. Farms being that uh, uh, the idea that we could convert these hill farms into dairy farms. That was an idea that was uh, brought out in the late 19th century. Flatlanders is, uh, refers to the migration of educated wealthy urbanites into Vermont, basically after the 1930s up through. And Fords is in automobiles. So. Instead of going over the whole book, uh, I think what I'm going to do here, no, oh, this is what I'm going to do, is, is I'm going to talk about the last and uh, focus on that. Basically, the effects of the automobile on, on uh, rural Vermont specifically, uh, everything is through the filter of North Pomfort because that was uh, what I focused on. But a lot of the things that I found found out, I think are pretty applicable throughout rural Vermont, just timing and the details a little bit different. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's uh, where we're going to go. So basically, uh, well, before 1900, there weren't any automobiles in North Pomfret. In fact, I don't, maybe someone here knows, but uh, I think Mil what used to be Miller Auto in White River, that was the oldest Cadillac dealer. I think in the United States until it went out of business. And I think it started like 1902 or somewhere like that. But uh, people first heard about automobiles, of course, through newspaper and periodicals. And you know, it was this machine. They probably couldn't imagine what, what it was going to be like. And um, <laughs> there's a story about the first time, I don't know if it's the first time, but one of the first times that uh, North Pomfret encountered an automobile, and my grandfather was in on it. And my <coughs> grandfather told a friend of mine the story, and said, someone came up the road, said, you know, waving arms, like, car's coming, an automobile. Went up through and saw my grandfather and his father and family come out, and along they look up the road, you know, waiting, and they see their neighbors, the Stetsons, are doing the same thing. And up above that, the Harringtons are standing out there looking. <laughs> well, pretty soon, you know, 
and you said this car comes along and goes by and out of sight. It was just this amazing thing, you know, it's going all of probably five miles an hour, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it was a real, uh, real novelty. And at first, of course, uh, automobiles were, were uh, viewed as playthings of the wealthy. Uh, in, in Woodstock, I know, it, it's part of the research I had done also was going through newspapers. I uh, went through 80 years of newspapers from 1900 to 1980. And so uh, you really get a sense of, of uh, a lot of these deep, you get a lot of details out of this. And one was uh, the, the Pomfret correspondent, the North Pomfret correspondent talked about Mrs. Faulkner and, who sh and her chauffeur from Woodstock had made it up into Pomfret and stopped at the Warrens to buy a few apples. And it was a sumptuous, sumptuous automobile. You know, just this, you know. And another one, uh, the Sherburns up there, uh, uh, old uh, John Sherburn, he had a friend who came up with his Stanley Steamer. So, you know, he came up and gave them a ride, and that was, you know, that was to be written and talked about. So this, you know, you're talking in the early 1900s, 19 to 1910 or so, well, the first ones purchased by North Pomfret residents, um, one was uh, uh, by Fred Davis. Now, I don't see in the Davises here, but uh, Freddie Davis, Stephen Davis, this would be Freddie Davis's uh, grandfather, actually. Uh, he lived up in Pomfret, farmed, and he was a fairly uh, well-off guy at that time, and he owned one of the first automobiles. And uh, another, an, in fact, uh, one of, the, one of the oldest person that lived in North Pompeii that I talked with said her first automobile ride was with Fred Davis in his car. So you can just imagine, you know, everybody around there getting a ride. Another one was an early automobile, which made more of an impact, was by a guy named Silas Birch. And some of the older residents uh, that I talked with in the years <laughs> past, they couldn't figure why Silas, because he was kind of this, you know, sloppy kind of a you know, uh, uh, not uh, ambitious or, or uh, you know, or, or outgoing or anything like that, and certainly not rich, but he went out and purchased an automobile. And, you know, people were saying, well, you know, why him? And he had that automobile, and my gosh, right after that, you see all these notices, or all these uh, uh, accounts in, in the Vermont Standard about Silas and his automobile taking people out for rides. And people were paying him to take him out on rides. And so Silas has been busy this week. He went here, he went there. And, well, so I eventually, that was 19, 1913. And that was the year for going out for rides. And then people thought, well, Silas could do that. Why can't we? You know, he, he has an arm. It's not just the. So, 1914, I think there were like four different ones that, that got uh, automobiles. And I, have, I looked at the diary of one, uh, the daughter of one of them. And oh my gosh, you know, it was, uh, it was a big deal. And you know, you really could just see the pride in there showing off of this thing. And really that's, you know, that's what they were. They, they, they were not really practical and you know, they were, they were novelties at that time, but more like status symbols. So, yeah, uh, so with that, between 1940 and even into the 20s, anybody who bought an automobile would be in the Vermont Standard. <laughs> and the, the, the person would say, you know, but then by the 1920s, as we'll see a little bit later, you know, it became old news. Um, so, as I said, automobiles, automobiles weren't necessary on the farm at that time. You know, and in fact, I, the, I remember coming across one article and it said, does it pay for the farmer on the farm to own an automobile? You know, this question was, it a, you know, did it make sense for them? And, you know, by this time, uh, more people saying yes. But, they're, you know, the problems of them and maintenance were, were per pervasive. Uh, one of the biggest problems at first, of course, was encountering horses 
and not for the automobile, but for the people and the horses. I mean, you know, if you can imagine a horse and uh, coming the road, and there's this thing that they've never experienced before. I mean, you, there were a lot of accidents. Uh, I, I know there's several accounts of uh, some of the, one with a wagon that went over the bank, someone else uh, with a carriage, and they tipped over. So there's there's uh, one letter where the where the uh, sister said. We're sticking to the hill roads so that we can avoid the automobiles, <laughs> with the, the horse and buggy. And I think there, there was uh, there was one guy who had an advertising uh, an advertisement in the Woodstock paper that he will train your horse to be fearless of automobiles, <laughs> guaranteed. And so after two weeks, you know, you you could guarantee that your horse would be, you know, so that that was that was a big deal. Um, Constance Strong, uh, her diary for 1915 is pretty interesting in because uh, uh, her, her family had an automobile and they tried, I think they made it, yeah they made it but they had trouble coming back to Blake Fairly and there's one, one little hill that they, they had to go way down into, I don't know if it was first year or second year or they had to back up it anyways and they blew it. <laughs> They blew a tire and, oh, they had an awful time getting back. So, on a, on a lighter note, they had friends stop with their own automobile at, at the Strong's to try to show off their, their rig. Well, that was fine. When, it went, when they went to leave, they couldn't start it. And so, everybody was around in, the men are tinkering, tinkering, and <laughs> about an hour, and finally, someone's, oh, hmm, the gas valve was off. So, <laughs> <laughs> as simple as that. Uh, one of the things, you know, I mean, we just, at least I do, I mean, if I check my oil once a month, I'm lucky, you know, my car, but mostly you jump in the car and you just go. But in uh, one diary that, uh, of a guy that was uh, from 1917, he talks about the maintenance. And this diary, it's not a complete diary either. This is just a, uh, sorry, I'm going to take these off here, but... Um, it was between, uh, let's see, May and December. And within that, uh, Carl Johnson had to change, repair, and remount tires, replace the belt, work on the carburetor, oil and grease the car, clean the spark plugs, tend to a failed emergency brake, patch into tubes, tighten skier, steering gear, and walk home when his car stalled a little ways above the Roberts place. <laughs> so. Going out with one, you know, sometimes you wondered if you were going to uh, make it back. So over time, uh, they did find those that, you know, gosh, these automobiles they can be kind of handy. Uh, and my great grandfather never owned one, but gosh, he seems in his 1918 diary there to rely on people with them, you know, and hauling, hauling pigs here or uh, getting grain or something. So. You know, they started to be uh, um, handy. In the 1920s, especially in the 1920s, you see an explosion of people buying them. And part of that is, of course, Henry Ford's, uh, you know, his way of making things cheaper with the, with the assembly line and mass production. And also, banks started giving loans for automobiles. You know, that was, that was an innovation. So they got more people, uh, you know, and, and you know, it, it really, uh, really took off. In fact, um, see, there is a prediction here by someone in the uh, Vermont Standard. Uh, they predicted that soon, nearly everybody in this section of the country will be traveling around in his own automobile. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, Vermont registration figures between 1920 and 1921 alone showed a 23% percent increase in card registrations in the state in that in that one year so 1920s it, it was you know like the go go 80s here you know <laughs> that time before the 30s came in um, so you had cars but it took a long time for them to become daily necessities uh, first of all they weren't built for year-round use you know at first they were open and um, they were put up for winter because, you know, I mean, they didn't have the antifreeze at that time. <laughs> in fact, my great uncle talked about 
a time when he and uh, uh, Scott Harrington were cutting wood for a family, a Dana family up on the hill, and they would take the car up, and this was during the winter, and they, every time they went up, they would drain the radiator in the morning, and then they'd fill it back up at night with water and, and go back down. So that's you know how they get up there. But uh, the biggest factor was the roads. You know, uh, the car development outpaced road development. I mean, by the 1930s, cars became enclosed. You know, you had heat, you had safety features, and all. In fact, uh, I will bet that the cars then are closer to our cars now, minus computers, uh, than they were to the automobiles of 15 years previously. So, you know, cars came a long way, but as I say, the roads did not. Uh, uh, plowing roads, of course, was uh, rudimentary at that time. Uh, I think the Pomfret, they, in fact, my great uncle worked on it. They had a, uh, a crawler, a single crawler tractor with a V plow. And so, with that name, you can imagine how fast things get plowed out, you know. <laughs> so, I, that, and I think the main one was they kept the main road, main road open through town, not the, uh, not the back roads. So, in fact, and this is, I think, 19, 1925, uh, there was uh, this uh, article that talked about an effort to try to keep an open winter road between White River and Montpelier. <laughs> and gosh, they praised the people up north from Northfield to Montpelier. They did a great job. But gosh, you know, those people in, in East Granville and, you know, places there, well, someone was going to Montpelier to see about getting a plow, and another town, the Sletman, were scurrying around. So it was town by town. You had sections that, you know, that, that varied. It was the state, you know, went through the whole thing. So, whoop, here's Sharon. Ah! <laughs> But um, uh, so the, 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 main, the, the main road through North Pomfret was kept open, and one of the biggest things that was for, because this was the farming neighborhood, was to pick up the milk at this time. And uh, a lot of the farmers were on the back roads. The milk truck came up the plowed road, and the farmers would have to come down with sleds and bring their milk down in cans to the main road, and they would have platforms where they would meet the, meet the, the truck, pick them up. Um, so, you know, that was, that was what was, went along. And, and the, when good weather was there, it was fine. You know, they could, they could go, up, go to individual farms. Uh, spring was another thing. Um, uh, spring rose. When, you know, it was about a month, uh, you're dealing with mud. And uh, the 1928 uh, spring mud season was pretty notable up there because um, the milk truck had been in existence for you know a couple of years and there was a guy named Sherm Manning, some people may know that name from down this way, he hired a new man just before spring mud season and he, he uh, uh, got baptized in the mud. <laughs> so he, uh, uh, but it, when mud season started, it was announced that he couldn't get through. The roads were too bad. So farmers, what they were going to have to do was to uh, bring their uh, uh, milk the old-fashioned way, bring it down in s sleds and try to get through and get down to West Hartford to put it on the railroad car, the way it was in the old days when they would do that. So they did that, but spring being spring, you had high water. And this was, this was the year after the 1927 flood, which, you know, was the worst one since, uh, I mean, before Irene. And uh, the bridge was out in West Hartford, so there was a ferry. Well, with the high water, the ferry couldn't run. So the farmers couldn't get down to West Hartford. They had to go all the way around, up through Sharon, uh, up around over Howe Hill, Sharon, and, and go to the railroad there and bring their milk there. And plus, the milk train didn't go on Sundays. The milk, the milk cars didn't go, so it was, it was really a, you know, a big bother then. So, anyways, uh, you had automobiles that, that you know, were getting to be pretty reliable, but you had roads that, that were not. 
So uh, I think I looked in one diary, Constance, well, by this time her name was Constance Clifford. Uh, she wrote that, uh, it was in January, that, that Elton took out the card for the first time in two weeks. So that was, mm, I think, 1935. So even at that date, you know, I mean, trying to, I mean, Dave, using your automobile daily was, you know, not a, not a possibility and not a necessity. Now, World War II, uh, the Depression and World War II tended to keep things that way, too. You know, the Depression was uh, uh, pretty hard, and World War II resources were put into winning the war, of course. But with the end of World War II, and here's the second part of this, this talk here, is, is uh, the real influence that the automobile had after uh, things really came together, roads and cars and uh, opportunities. So World War II, the end of World War II was a watershed. You had all these returning vets coming home looking for automobiles. And uh, the economy really took off in the post-World War II period. So, you know, for almost 30 years, you had this continual expansion. And uh, also, roads progressed, too. Uh, they're, they're, my uh, uh, father's cousin uh, was a road foreman in later years, but he remembers when he denied, uh, when he re refused to take the road commissioner job back during World War II because uh, the former one had quit because he couldn't get the sledman to give him any money. And my, my father's cousin said he wasn't going to take it, so the sledman decided that they were going to run the roads. They'd take care of it. Well, <laughs> there's a notice in the newspaper saying, North Pomfret, or Pomfret has hired Moses Chase to be our new road commissioner with a generous, very generous uh, appropriation of money. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Slutman Tree, they, could, they couldn't do it. And, but the, the timing of this was perfect. I mean, they put a lot of money into improving the roads. And of course, then, you know, uh, you know paving of roads uh, uh, and, you know, leading up to the interstate being constructed too. But going back a little bit, <clears throat> being able to, to commute daily was a big deal. I mean, that had never happened before. Uh, for the first time, people could live in North Pomfret and not have to farm for a living. And up till then, I mean, farming was, you know, it was starting to get kind of shaky and you lost farms in the, in, during the Depression. and, and you know, in the, after the 1940s, I think there was a quote in, in, in the Commissioner of Agriculture's report in 1950 that the price of milk is a little more than it was a decade ago. <coughs> Ten years later, in 1960, he said, the price of milk is less than it was 10 years ago. So you had the, the, this, the price of milk stagnated. And so, um, you know, it, there's, you could have had a, w without, without daily community, people trying to live there, they would have had to farm, but if they can't farm, uh, you know, what are they going to do? So the automobile really uh, uh, came into its own and, and uh, <coughs> provided a lot of opportunity for people to be able to come down to places like White River, West Lebanon, even Woodstock, places that were really starting to uh, boom in the post-war <coughs> post-war era, you know, new jobs and opportunities, so people are coming down. Um, so what this did was it kind of made places like North Pomfret uh, desirable places to live for the first time for average people. You know, uh, they could uh, uh, get a little piece of land and build a house and commute to work. That was, you know, that was looked at as a uh, is pretty good. I think in the in the years between 1870 and and the end of World War II, only four houses had been built in, in North Pomfret. Only four. There were some that were built that replaced burned houses and things like that. But as far as for new houses, there was only four within that. And then you know, I mean, you've had since since then, you know, you've had uh, uh, I think over 200 probably. 
So, um, and that's and that is a direct result of the automobile. Um, so, people just didn't go out and, and uh, you know buy a lot of land and build instant uh, suburbs there in North Pomfret. But one of the things that was very popular was trailers or mobile homes at that time. Um, they came into vogue, which you know now people you know they, you kind of look down on trailers. <laughs> and uh, at that time, there was a joke. I mean, it was it was good because a lot of the natives, the old retiring natives, and new uh, couples uh, bought these trailers and, and lived in them. They were very affordable. But I think. Um, uh, there was a saying that said that trailers were for the newly wed and the nearly dead. <laughs> so so, so they, were, they were affordable for those different groups. So, in fact, I mean, I, I, I can't remember now, but I think there was like uh, 13 or 14 that I was able to trace uh, natives who put in mobile homes in the 1950s and 60s. So they became popular. Uh, and even outsiders uh, would come in. They want, would buy a small piece of land and set up, uh, you know, mobile homes. So this was in the 1950s and 60s. And at this point of my talk, I'm going to focus on one aspect of uh, of what this automobile culture and trailers and uh, uh, led to. And really, it, it's um, it facilitated a different use of land. Whereas before, before that land was to make a living by, and uh, you know you farmed it, and now it became something that you could, you know, you could build a house on and live there without farming, and you didn't need all that land. So, um, the late '50s and the '60s um, really witnessed a backlash against the automobile culture. And particularly in North Pomfret, what sparked this was trailers. In fact, um, uh, in Woodstock, in the, in the Standard, there was a quote, uh, let's see, it was 1957, and the, the Woodstock Chamber of Commerce meeting, the subject was planning, because it was recognized that the fingers of urban sprawl are already creeping up the Connecticut River Valley. And, uh, you know, if that doesn't sound, you know, <laughs> scary, I don't know what. You know. Uh, so people were thinking about it even then. And in, in North Pomfret, this came together with, as I said, agriculture was declining, it had been declining for some time, but also it coincided with the gentrification of North Pomfret. You had newcom newcomers coming in, buying the old farms because you know they wanted to uh, to have a country place, and uh, and they could get there also, and you know more disposable income. And actually, the state put up a really uh, a really good campaign to attract people to come up and buy old farmhouses. <coughs> they, they they hired Dorothy Canfield Fisher, she was this famous Vermont writer, to write up this pamphlet. And it was a masterful job that she did. She basically turned, you know, whereas before it was, you know, these old abandoned, rundown farms. No, no, that's not what they are now. They're potential country estates. <laughs> so that was that was part of the, the selling. And in, in North Pomfret, in North Pomfret, uh, you know, people people came. And uh, I think by uh, uh, by the 1970s, more than half the houses. The old historic houses were owned by, by newcomers that had been gentrified. So, uh, the issue in North, in North Pomfret of uh, auto, the automobility uh, era and the problems that people saw with that came together and really created, uh, well, about a, a decade of contention in North Pomfret. So, um, as I said, the, the effort began in trying to curb trailers. The newcomers who come, you know, they come to have nice views and, you know, hopefully neighbors' cows are out there and stuff. They didn't want to see neighbors' trailer. So, 
um, the, I remember there was a guy who I talked with who was a newcomer uh, who actually sparked the, the, the contention, according to him. One day he got up and he was going to go to Woodstock and he's driving around, going around the church and around the corner and there Someone put up a trailer. He said, how the hell did that trailer get there? <laughs> Seemingly overnight. <laughs> well, he turned right around and he went to his friends that, you know, because a lot of these people came up. They had neighbors and friends from down country who bought places. And, you know, th they were just sick of this. You know, these things are coming up seemingly everywhere, going like mushrooms. So they decided that they were going to put together an effort to try to limit trailers and institute zoning. Well... You know, zoning, uh, geez, that's the government, uh, God, uh, that's government control, you know, God echoes here, I guess, you know, uh, you know, are we fighting communism? That's what these old, these old Yankees, you know, they, you know, wanted, uh, they didn't want any, anything to uh, uh, keep, well, and, and you can understand in certain respects, because for the first time, you know, these people who, you know, they're, they're dying farming, and but yet they can sell land. In fact, the Windsor County agent made that point in one of his articles. Said, you know, the, that farming's going out, I mean, about, and this had to do with the, uh, uh, I think with the bulk tank issue. He said about a third of the farmers in Windsor County will go out. He said, thank God they still have their land they can sell. You know? Because that was anathema to newcomers who'd come in and wanted to preserve the neighborhood. So, Natives were resentful at this effort, and uh, they, they actually were able to keep zoning out of Pomfret for uh, 10 years until Queechy Lakes came. And Hartford, when Queechy Lakes came, Hartford was all open arms for Queechy Lakes to come in and rehabilitate uh, Queechy Village. Pomfret, on the other hand, uh, was the people in Pomfret, most of the newcomers, they were appalled. They didn't, you know, they didn't want any sort of development like that. And when Quichy Lakes bought some land in Pomfret and planned to divide it up into, uh, you know, one acre little parcels, well, there was a big effort then, uh, and a successful one, unlike uh, Otis Guernsey's effort in 1961, uh, this, this effort succeeded. And newcomers got together and they were well organized and they put out this pamphlet and they were able to use scare tactics, you know, against the natives and as far as, you know, they're going to be, uh, uh, you know, what's, what's it going to be on the schools? You know, there could be kids coming and roads are going to be more expensive to maintain up in there. And uh, so they got enough natives on board to pass zoning at that time. And, and it's funny because... Uh, you see this race, because Queech Lakes is trying to get the District 3 Environmental Commission to approve, because uh, Act 250, the state zoning, statewide plan use uh, uh, law had, was in effect already. So if they could get their permit through the Environmental Commission, they could actually beat Pomfret, if, um, if Pomfret didn't enact zoning before that. So the selectmen, they, it seems there was kind of a, a deal here where they, they went to the District 3 uh, Environmental Commission and said, you know, we're, we want to really try to keep them out. And the commission held up Queechee Lakes' permit until they had the vote in Pomfret. And when the vote went that they were, were going to pass zoning, Queechee Lakes was all done there. So uh, they, they uh, uh, you know, kept it out. Now, of course, you know, the, the, the big focus was Queechee Lakes, but of course there were other uh, effects on, and natives were worried about, well, we're going to be able to subdivide our land, you know, and sell land. And, and newcomers, you know, a lot of them were, well, wow, finally, okay, we have a tool where we can keep the hills and the fields pristine. Well, come to find out, you know, it's sometimes, sometimes uh, it's different when you get what you want. It's sometimes not what you expected. And zoning in Pomfret was, was uh, it, didn't, it didn't keep natives from subdividing their land 
and it didn't preserve farmland either. So the unintended consequences of all this was natives were able to subdivide, but right at this point, they, you know, subdividing and selling land, they were backing off from that. And they're viewing more land as a family resource to subdivide for family members rather than for quick profit. And newcomers, you know, I mean, uh, they found that if they want to preserve that field over there, they'd have to buy it. <clears throat> so, in fact, I know my, uh, uh, my uncle gave uh, one couple a heart attack, I think, about a heart attack when he was going to maybe build a camp up on top of the knoll overlooking their little farmhouse. And uh, so uh, they, they, they scurried and they bought the land. <laughs> so, so it was a mixed, you know, a mixed bag. And um, I, I'd say that overall, um, it has been a mixed bag for uh, the people in North Park, for many in, in Vermont. And I've just focused on the automobile here, but um, uh, other aspects of, of interaction have led to accommodation, I think. So uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up right there. And if people want to talk or comment or uh, ask questions, we'll just do that. <laughs>